welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is kind of a presentation of my thesis research. And the research is really only about a third of the way done, so uh, just something to keep in mind. Like a lot of this, these ideas are things I want to like, go deeper into and explore more. Um, but it felt like already like a lot of really cool stuff had come up and I wanted to share with people. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and just to introduce like kind of where this research came out of, mainly from two different places. So one was all these courses I was taking in like soil microbiology, soil uh, microbial ecology, uh, that I took because I wanted to learn more about like how to manage the soil in the agricultural system. Uh, and then I learned like a lot of really cool stuff and it was really inspiring and it really changed the way I, I saw things. But then I realized like after all these courses I didn't really know anything more <clears throat> about what to actually do uh, in a practical way. So there was all this knowledge but it was in like a box and it didn't really connect with anything else, just uh, in this one circle. But then because my, my background is more in like anthropology and philosophy and uh, farming, so I wanted to see like what happens if you take like these uh, circles of knowledge uh, that are really separate usually and just like mush them all together and then s see what happens. And uh, also to do that in a way that's not just like taking the social science and then like bring natural science into it or the other way because this happens a lot is like uh, in, in attempts to combine social and natural science it's just like one of them just uh, kind of consumes the other one. So I want to see, is there a way that we could do this in a more uh, balanced way? And then the other uh, source of inspiration was kind of uh, these conversations I was having with Native American farmers last summer. And these were conversations about soil and the way that they saw soil and <clears throat> yeah, how they saw the relationship between humans and soil. And this really opened up like a lot of new ideas for me and also kind of uh, it helps uh, open up possibilities for this project of combining social and natural science. So I wanted to start with just uh, one of these stories that I heard from, uh, from these Native Americans. And this is the creation myth of the Haudenosaunee tribe. So they live on the border of upstate New York and, and Canada. And they're famous for growing these the three sisters, which is like maize, beans, and squash. Um, they're also known for giving a lot of inspiration to the early women's liberation movement in the 1800s in the US. And also a lot of the ideas for the original American democracy came from their uh, political system. Uh, but then they, they tell this story about the, the time of long ago in, in history, in, in mythical time. And there's the sky world, and then there's our world below. And um, this is just a small part of a bigger story. But at, at one point, the, the sky world had, had opened up and Sky Woman falls through, and this is what's happening here. She's falling through the sky. And so the birds of our world come up and, and they hold her to keep her from falling for a little bit. But uh, they can only hold her for a short time. Um, and at this point in history, there's only sky and, and water. Uh, there's no land yet. And so the birds and the fish are talking to each other and they're saying uh, this woman can't live in the sky and she can't live in, in the water so she needs to have something else. And they're trying to figure out what else this could be. And then one of the fish remembers like he had heard a story a long time ago that all the way at the bottom of the, the ocean there's, there's something else. It's not uh, sky, it's not air, and it's not water. And, and so they go down and they take up some of the sediment from the ocean floor and, and bring it up and they put it on the back of the turtle. And then the birds uh, bring Sky Woman over and, and lay her down on, on the back of the turtle. And then she starts doing the women's dance. And the women's dance is this kind of like shuffling dance where your feet never come off the ground, so you, you maintain like constant connection with the earth. And then, and they still do this dance uh, today. And through this dance, then the soil grows and grows and, and uh, the turtle gets bigger and bigger and then it becomes uh, what they call Turtle Island, which is like uh, where all the Haudenosaunee live today. And uh, we would call it like the continent of North America, basically. Um, so th yeah, there's a, a lot more to the story, but um, at least for this part, I think there's two really interesting 
uh, things that come out of it. And one is that the soil isn't shown as like uh, existing before humans, and then we just come and start living on top of it. It's that the soil is shown as being like a, a project that humans and non-humans are working at together. And uh, a lot of times in the West we have a dualism of humans and non-humans, of nature and culture. And this doesn't really exist in, in their worldview. And so this is one way to see that. And then the other one is that the soil is, is alive. And there's a point later on in the story where yeah, Sky Woman has been living on Turtle Island for a while, and then she gives birth to the, the creator of humans. And then uh, the creator has just created the first humans, and then he reaches down. This is why it's called the myth of the Earth Grasper, because he reaches down and takes up some of the, the soil. And then he's holding it in his hand, and he, he says, like, you humans and you, the soil, you're both alive. And because you're alive, then you have social relationships with each other and also social obligations um, of reciprocity. So there's a give and take between uh, everything that's alive. Who said that too? The creator of the humans. Okay. So this is the son of the sky one. The son of the sky Yeah. Uh, and then what I want to show is that actually these two ideas are really kind of the same thing. It's this uh, idea of seeing humans and non-humans, of all living things, as living in friendship with each other. So for my research, I've been uh, on one side, doing a lot of uh, literature review, reading, all sorts of things. And on the other side, doing field work with farmers and with soil scientists. So like with the soil scientists following them around in the lab and in the field, and doing interviews, just uh, li uh, listening to like what they have to say, but also how they say it. Like how do, how do people talk about soil? <coughs> and the same with the farmers. So the past, so just to give some context, the past few years has been kind of like a renaissance in, in, in soils, and especially with soil life and soil biology. Like, a, I guess a lot of us know that like last year was the International Year of Soils. Um, in Norway, we, last year I was working with a, a group called the Living Soils Project. I was funded by the government. And this is Elaine Ingham and the Soil Food Web, which has become like a big uh, movement in farming and gardening. And now also Monsanto and some of these other big transnational corporations are getting in on it, with the, starting the BioAg Alliance, which is mainly about selling uh, microbial, like bacterial, fungal inputs uh, to farmers as inoculants. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so, so with, I was at a workshop with this Soil Food Web uh, and Elaine Ingham last year. And basically, whenever farmers would ask her for advice, uh, it was always the same message. It was just add life. And she's advocating using compost teas and these sort of things. But I think if you look at this, this statement, just add life, uh, and think about it, it's like a very strange kind of thing to say. And it's not really so clear exactly what that means. <clears throat> so this is my first uh, research question, which is kind of came out of that, which is, to ask, like, what exactly do people mean when they say that the soil is alive? Because these are things that kind of get thrown around a lot um, in alternative agriculture uh, um, circles, but also in soil biology. I'm talking about the living soil and soil being alive. So I wanted to kind of break that down and see what exactly that means. And if everyone means the same thing when they say that. So um, this also reflects on, on uh, more broader questions about like what does it mean for anything to be alive and we've had kind of a consensus idea of what life means for about 200 years and Foucault has written a lot about this how uh, basically modern biology and our modern idea of what life is um, appear in the early 1800s and then this is kind of stable for until recently and then because of various factors like um, developments in artificial intelligence, um, in synthetic biology, and some other places. Now our idea of what life is is starting to break down a little bit, and this opens up space um, for different claims on, on life. And um, I think you find some really interesting things in, in this space, especially with soil. <clears throat> and it's led to some interesting conversations. Like last, uh, a couple weeks ago, I had a conversation with a soil biologist, and we were talking about the um, what she was calling the abiotic-biotic uh, divide in soil science, which is it, basically in the history of soil science, 
uh, it was mainly about physics and chemistry. And then only recently have biology and ecology come into it. And, and still there's a really big divide between the soil, physic, soil physicist and chemist on one side and the biologist and ecologist on the other, and they don't really talk to each other so much. Um, but she, she, so she is studying nitrous oxide uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the soil. And she was saying that it's only very recently that the modeling for the emissions have taken uh, soil life into account. And, but then I was thinking like, and I said to her like, that's kind of strange because <clears throat> don't, uh, like the, all the emissions come from denitrifying bacteria. And so we talked a little bit more just to figure out like what exactly she meant. And it turned out when she said soil life, she was just talking about like earthworms and arthropods, like uh, macrofauna. Um, but then these bacteria and fungi, like the microbes, they are somehow in a different mental category uh, th than the bigger animals. And so this is kind of a distinction between life in the soil, which is more of our conventional idea of uh, living organisms, so like plants and animals, and then life of the soil, which is uh, the microbes that you don't really see, but there's still life there somehow. And this is a little bit more abstract and a little bit more vague. Uh, and also I think it's uh, a little bit more interesting. So there's, yeah, there's this prokaryotic, uh, eukaryotic uh, dualism, basically, between the, the larger multicellular organisms and then the uh, microbes. Uh, but I've, I keep finding all, lots of other dualisms like this, and it's kind of been a recurrent theme in the research. And the, the nature culture one is, uh, is pretty familiar, I think, and there's been a lot written about that. And some people say, like, this is the fundamental um, <clears throat> aspect of Western thought, is that we make a distinction between the natural realm and the cultural realm, uh, which no one else has really ever done. This is also why like, social science and natural science are, are split. Uh, but besides that, there's also like an above-ground, below-ground dualism, and then there's a biotic, abiotic one in soil science, and then this is the prokaryotic, eukaryotic one. And th these are dualisms rather than like a duality, so a duality is just like when you divide things into opposites, like you, in like Buddhist or Taoist philosophy. Uh, these are dualisms because there's a, a structure of domination between them, um, where, where one is sort of favored and the other one is defined in opposition to, to the dominant one. And it's interesting to like, look at the way that people write about prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and it's really the same way that people write about hunter-gatherers and uh, civilized societies, like they're using the same kind of language. Um, so I think all these dualisms have social, economic, uh, uh, political implications also. Um, so I've been focusing on progress, like the same way that a lot of anthropologists are interested in uh, uh, hunter-gatherers. Uh, I've been really interested in the microbes because I think I find them really interesting. Uh, and they have this kind of capacity to deterritorialize because all of our, like, our mental categories and ideas are based on eukaryotic life. Uh, or on, like, on uh, modern civilization, and then we bring those into the way that we look at uh, other societies. So we also bring our categories from eukaryotic life into the way that we talk about microbes, and they don't really match up. So the microbes show that the way that we think about life is uh, contingent. It's not like a, just a natural thing. It's not a, it's uh, constructive somehow. And I don't understand what you mean. Yeah, like, um... I also don't know what you mean with that they deterritorialize. Yeah, so deterritorialization is like this this concept that uh, we try to make everything into, like, neat categories. And then, so this is territorialization. It's just dividing things into clearly defined yeah. zones and categories. Uh -huh. And then deterritorialization is, like, how these uh, boundaries are disrupted. So microbes do this on like a very little literal way. Is that like you can't really uh, keep them separate; they just are flowing everywhere. But they also do this in kind of a mental way uh, on our ideas of what life is, because we have this I, like our ideas about evolution happening as like a tree. Um, 
this is our natural way to think about evolution, and this comes from like how animals evolve. Um, but that bacteria will just are just constantly exchanging uh, DNA with each other, uh, and so it doesn't evolution for bacteria doesn't happen like a tree, like in a linear way. It's it's uh, kind of a circular. Um, yeah, so I was interested in like how do people actually because this shows where the scientific ideas about life and our uh, folk, like our everyday ways of thinking about life, don't really match up. And so I, I really wanted to focus on like, these, these practical uh, ways that we think about uh, microbes. And so I started looking at like, what are the patterns of behavior that we have when, uh, when we're interacting with uh, bacteria and fungi. And I started realizing that a lot of these patterns of behavior are very similar to the ways in which like a hunter-gatherer or an indigenous society is, is relating to, to nature spirits. Um, and these, these kind of invisible forces of nature. And so this is something I've been calling micro-animism. Animism is the term used when you, you see everything as being alive, as life is being distributed uh, through the whole world. So this happens on a few different levels. So like one level is that um, we know both microbes and nature spirits by their effects, but we never actually like perceive them directly. Um, we just we just see what they've done. And, um, and another level is, is that the way that we interact with them is usually mediated by specialists. So in a, with nature spirits, it's, it's mediated through the shaman or the medicine man. Uh, whereas with microbes, it's it's mediated by some, like medical doctors or uh, researchers, and I think the most interesting uh, level is that there's uh, there's like an ambiguity with both of them, so that some are good and some are bad, and so there's always good spirits and, and bad spirits, and there's good microbes and bad microbes, and then a lot of like what characterizes the way that we interact with them is trying to favor the good ones uh, against the bad ones. And yeah, so this whole idea that, that microbes can be good is actually like a pretty recent idea. I think it's been a pretty radical shift from the, the thought that's been dominant for a long time. So that's like the, the Pasteurian regime is, is um, basically that microbes are bad, like the germs cause disease. Um, and we should just get rid of them, and that would make everything better. Uh, and so this leads to like a approach to health and medicine, which is basically about killing germs. And it also leads to a type of agriculture, which is mainly about killing pests. And um, recently, you're starting to, to see a, a shift, and it's like a very rapid shift too. Like uh, a few years ago, like no one really knew about the microbiome or like about gut microbes. And now it's like now pretty much everyone does, and, and people are also changing their the way they live uh, because of this. So I don't I don't think this is necessarily like the same as like indigenous views, but at least it shows that there is a kind of continuity with it and uh, some possibilities. <clears throat> um, yeah, to, to shift completely for a minute, this is an interesting picture that came up in my Facebook feed a few months ago. And so this is an American army soldier in Iraq who, whose wife sent him a care package, which consisted of like a few bags of American soil and grass seed and uh, chemical fertilizers. <laughs> and so he's kind of created a, a stereotypical American lawn uh, outside of the, the tent in, in Iraq. And before they go out on, on a mission, like him and the whole patrol will, will like walk uh, ritually th through the American soil before going out on, on their mission. So I think sometimes when people say like, yeah, now we just see soil as like being dirt or as like a resource to be uh, a commodity, uh, I think this shows that there's actually a much more complex uh, role in the cultural imagination for soil. And this is something that's been going on for a long time. Like the, the democracy in, in classical Athens um, is famous, and it's also uh, written about how, how there are citizens and there's non-citizens. 
And for the citizens, it's a very inclusive democracy where everyone has the right to vote. But then for a lot of people, they don't have any uh, uh, access to the political process at all. Um, but if you look at like why uh, some people are considered citizens and some not, uh, it, it goes back to this event in mythical time when Apollo, uh, for some reason, his sperm had spilled out from the heavens and fallen on the soil around Athens when the city was first being created. And from this, this mixture of the soil and the, the god's sperm, the first Athenian people kind of were created. And if you can trace your lineage back to, to this uh, mixture, then you have the right to participate in the political process. Uh, but if you can't, if your ancestors came from somewhere else, from some other soils, then you're, you're not a citizen. So here I want to look at like how does the, the soil system uh, interact with, with the state system. And this is the soil state function, which is probably like the most, in soil science, it's probably the most uh, cited or the most well-known kind of equation. Uh, and it's a, it's a very different meaning of the word state, but I find the way that the two meanings of state overlap uh, uh, kind of generates interesting ideas. So basically what it's saying is that the properties of the soil will be a function of these different factors. Uh, these are, and these are called state variables. Um, and he, uh, when, it, when this was developed in the 40s, Hans Jenny, who's an American soil scientist, he, he left these ellipses uh, purposely at the end. Because he said, of course there are many other factors uh, that influence uh, soil properties. And he kind of left that up for other scientists to develop. And so <clears throat> here I wanted to kind of take him up on this challenge and see like what happens when you include the state apparatus as one of these uh, soil forming factors. <clears throat> and so I've taken the, the idea of the state apparatus from Deleuze, the French philosopher, and his, his image of this, the state is of this kind of like glacial force that, that moves over the land and <clears throat> it reworks everything according to its own logic. So where there's a lot of like heterogeneity before, the state moves over everything and, and homogenizes things. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, he says this is how you turn like the earth into territory. And he uses the word striation for this. So striation is, is taken from um, geology and it's the term for when a glacier a literal glacier moves over over the land and it, it as it moves over the rocks it makes all these lines and so all the lines are pointing in the same direction so this is the kind of the, the image for what happens when when the state moves over um, and and yeah so for some examples of this you, you can look at like in the history of india um, there's, there's someone who's done research on pollen counts in a, a lake in northern India. And from pollen counts, you can track a lot of things, but uh, one of them is the rate, erosion rate. And so they've sort of developed a, a chart of the erosion rates over the past 3,000 years in India. And they basically, shifts in the, the rate of erosion basically match up perfectly with regime changes throughout the history of India. Um, and this is the same thing that happens, like say, when you take European agriculture uh, and impose it uh, on Africa, for instance. So you take an agriculture that's adapted to um, climate with um, that has uh, snow cover in the winter and, and like low intensity of rain, and bring it into a tropical environment. Um, another aspect is legibility. So this is from uh, I got this idea from James Scott. Yes, as opposed to seeing like a state. Um, yeah, so this is the idea that, that the state um, reorders the natural world uh, in, in a way that makes it easier for it to understand. And so with soil mapping, like the very first soil maps that we know of are from medieval China. And, and they, were, they were made for taxation purposes. So that they made maps of the, the whole country and for each county, they would look at what are the soil properties, how much, how productive is it, and then base the taxation rates on that. And there's also really interesting soil maps uh, 
from the 1700s and um, the 1800s, uh, where they were trying to map out the relationship between people's personality and health with, uh, with soil qualities. Because they, they saw, um, yeah, they saw the people's personality, their temperament, uh, their health, uh, as being reflective of, of soil quality. And then this is an idea that disappears with modern medicine, and it's only re recently that we start talking about connections between human health and soil health. Um, and a lot of this like microbiome work being done is looking at how soil microbes actually affect like cognitive function and emotional function. And there's like a very strong influence of soil microbes on things like anxiety and depression and uh, memory also. Um, so a lot of these old ideas are coming back in a different way. But is that like the, in, in science then, the, the scientific explanation is that they produce certain compounds that go to your skin or whatever, or you breathe it. When you yeah, well, or, you, or you eat it. You yeah. eat it, yeah, and yeah. Then, you, then it changes you. Okay. Yeah, and then there's a lot of, like, in some cases they're actually directly, like, um, reworking the genetic uh, expression of, of, of brain neurons. Yeah. And, yeah, there's a lot of different uh, pathways. Cool. Okay, is it somewhere? Can I find it somewhere? Yeah, I can is send it? you yeah. sources. <laughs> uh, yeah, so some of the, the scientists here uh, that I've been talking to have just finished working on this, which is the Soil Biodiversity Atlas. So this is a different kind of uh, soil mapping. And it's a little different than what was happening in like medieval China. Like we're here in the soil and trying to make it legible uh, in some way to policy makers. OK, uh, yeah, shifting again. Um, I think this microbial semiotics thing is really interesting, but I, Maybe it's too much to get into right now. Um, but uh, yeah, for, as a mythological, mythological substrate, um, this is an idea that, that an anthropologist, uh, Levi Strauss, had. He, he was studying mythology in Native Americans. <clears throat> and he said that for a lot of these people, some things, uh, some plants and animals are good to eat, and other ones are good to think. So. I actually, it's not called the carga hand. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so some of them we, we use for, are good to eat, we use them for our subsistence. And the ones that are good to think are, are the ones that we kind of align our idea of, of what the world is like through. And, um, so, so here I, I was looking at how, <clears throat> yeah, so when I, I first learned about this mythology in, in the Haudenosaunee, and then I started looking at like what other uh, mythologies uh, of soil are there around the world. And pretty much every, uh, every culture has some kind of um, mythology of soil. And it's usually one of the most important myths in the culture. A lot of times it's the origin myth. And, a lot of times it also gives uh, kind of instructions for how humans and soil should interact and like what is the place of humans in the universe, what is the place of soil, and what is the relationship. Um, actually, the only group I've found that doesn't have one of these myths is like the, the Inuit in, in like northern Alaska, uh, which is, I don't know, it's because they, they don't depend directly on, on the soil for subsistence, but it's, uh, that's interesting. So yeah, our, our modern mythology, if you could go all the way back to the Judeo-Christian uh, myth of the, the Garden of Eden, uh, and, and their soil definitely plays a big role, like, the, like Adam, uh, the first uh, human, Adam means uh, soil in Hebrew, and there's a lot about soil there. Um, but I don't think this really influences the way that we live our lives so much today. Um, so besides the the examples that I showed, like in the of native soil and native territory from uh, that come from the state, uh, we also do have the, these other ideas of, of soil being like a, a substrate for growing plants in. There's some kind of uh, commodity that's part of the the market and capitalism, 
and also just as being dirt is something that's uh, somewhere where it shouldn't be when it's inside. This is something that's like uh, you bring in with your boots and you have to vacuum them up. So a lot of these come out of the, including capital into this, this soil's uh, state function. Like what are the articulations of soil with capital? Uh, and and w one of the processes in capitalism is to bring everything possible into the commodity form. And so this is something that's been happening with the soil as well. And yeah, so, so talking to these scientists, basically everything they're doing is in the framework of the ecosystem services. And this has happened since the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. This is, uh, and it's a pretty recent idea. Uh, so I haven't really gone in depth too much into this yet, but I, I want to look at like what, what are the implications, what are the consequences when you're looking at um, ecosystem pro processes in terms of them providing you services, or or, or as being capital. Because uh, once you bring in the word capital, then there's a whole uh, like uh, all of capitalism comes along with it. And then with with some of these. Uh, Groups like the BioAg Alliance, and there's a lot of smaller companies as well um, that have been um, capitalizing on, on this trend of, of valuing soil life uh, and selling inoculants of mycorrhizal fungi of nitrogen fixing bacteria. And so, uh, this is another thing I want to look into is like, how is this process of um, primitive accumulation of primitive things into the commodity form? How is this happening with, with microbes? Because uh, it, it usually involves a kind of simplification. Um, you could call it like a domestication of, of these soil microbes. Yeah, and just to, to bring it back to the what I was saying about Keisha before, uh, if you look at a lot of economic anthropology um, at how traditional economies work, usually your relationships with people who are kin and with people who are non-kin follow very different patterns. So your relationship with kin, uh, so kin here not just being people who you're genetically related to, but people who you have ongoing intimate social relationships with. Uh, these are all governed by rules of reciprocity, of uh, sharing, of gifting. Um, but then with non-kins, so traditionally there should be like people in a tribe far away on, on a different island. We're kind of effectively strangers. Um, with these people, then you try to maximize your personal gain. And these two patterns are, are pretty uh, um, pretty general, and you, you see them happening in a lot of different societies. Um, so, so here I think this shows that if we see soil as being kin versus non-kin, this also has economic implications. Um, Reciprocity here mainly being something like the re return of organic matter to, to the soil. Um, and are we doing that because uh, it increases our personal gain later or because we see uh, ourselves being in a social relationship with it? Yeah, and then, um, so a lot of these uh, trends which, which come out of articulations with, with capital and uh, with the state, uh, I've been calling above ground chauvinism. So this is like the kind of the domination of the below ground by by the above ground, and you see this in a lot of different cases. Like I was talking to the the head of the terrestrial ecology group, and he he said like yeah you hear about soil scientists but you never hear about above ground scientists. So so why is everything below ground? We can just put that into one category, um, whereas we need all these different disciplines for studying what happens above ground. Um, and also, like if you look at like green revolution breeding techniques, these are all breeding for above ground parts of plants rather than, than the root systems. Um, and this is basically breeding for um, immediate gain o over the long term uh, sustenance of the system. And so I've been calling this whole thing exile. So exile, for me, like the way I define it, is is this. Uh, Kind of conceit that we live on top of the earth rather than being of the earth, and that the earth is just like a rock that we are on top of, and we occasionally we, we mine it or we, we use it. Um, and this also connects to um, the Judeo-Christian mythology that we inherit, that we were 
banished from the Garden of Eden, and so we don't have a homeland. We don't have this kind of connection to place that you have in a lot of other cultures. And so this is an old idea. This is a this is the ladder of being from Aristotle, and uh, in in his view of the world, there was like the the male philosophers on top, then the female philosophers, and then male citizens, female citizens, slaves. Um, higher animals, lower animals, higher plants, lower plants, and then the mineral world is all the way at the bottom. So the, the minerals were seen as being the least developed, like the least devalued, uh, the least complex. Um, yeah, the least uh, alive, I guess. And it's really only when soil starts acting like a living thing that we start to pay attention to it. Um, so this is like a, a picture from the Dust Bowl in, in the US. And uh, nothing was, was done uh, on the federal level about the Dust Bowl until the, the dust storms actually blew all the way across the country and like they turned the skies black in Washington, D.C. for a whole week. And then, yeah, once you start to see soil as, as move, once it starts moving, once it starts acting like a living thing, then people pay attention to it. And yeah, some of these Greek philosophers um, in the early definitions of what is life and what is non-life, movement was a, was a big part of that. I think um, maybe it's not part of our scientific definition of movement, but uh, I think it's, it still plays a, a role in how we see things as being more alive or less alive. Uh, so with the erosion, when it starts acting like a, a living thing, then, then we, we pay attention to it as living. And um, the same thing like when it dies, like uh, when it stops providing uh, fertility for crop production. So it's only like when it dies that, that we, we recognize uh, it as important and alive. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's been uh, this chronological idea that first came minerals and then from minerals uh, come biological life uh, and organisms and then come humans on top, at the end of that. Um, but there's some uh, new ideas that are kind of disrupting this this chronology. So mineral coevolution is an idea from, from geology. Um, and th they point out that actually something like 70 or 80 percent of the minerals that exist in the world today uh, are directly, directly um, um, synthesized by or the result of biological processes. So this flips around because we usually see it as like the mineral world giving uh, or providing like a structure or a substrate f for biological life to, to appear on top of that. But, but um, they're showing this is actually more of a, uh, a two-way thing. To get that evolutionary tree. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, this evolutionary tree, I think, is, is connected to our idea of progress, that, that, that yeah. there's been progress going on, and things get more complex and less uh, more valued. Uh, and then another trend is looking at things like the Terrapenta, like the Amazonian dark earths, and seeing that not only can humans actually create soil or, or participate in the creation of soil, but we can actually make very, uh, like, really good soil too. And this is uh, sort of the same idea that, that you see in the Haudenosaunee creation myth. So Tim Ingold, who's an anthropologist, has summed up uh, how a lot of these indigenous people see the earth. And he says, uh, yeah, in, in contrast to the Western view, and for them, the earth, far from providing a solid foundation for existence, appears to float like a fragile and ephemeral raft, woven from the strands of terrestrial life and suspended in the great sphere of the sky. So this is like a completely different uh, way of seeing things than as just like a rock that we stand on. And then he goes on to say that like, for these people, uh, life is not an attribute of things at all. That's to say it does not emanate from a world that already exists, populated by objects as such. Uh, but rather, life is imminent in the very process of that world's continual generation or coming into being. So these two ideas uh, are connected. The way that you see the Earth and the way that you see life are, are related here. Uh, and so just to close up, I think, uh, the 20th century has, has, was really focused on, on genetics, like people call it genetics the master science of, of the 20th century. And it's led to a lot of uh, interesting knowledge and some nice uh, 
developments. But uh, if you only focus on genetics, then you could only really look at difference uh, or degrees of difference. Um, and so we look at kinship in terms of uh, genetics. And then someone who you've never met, uh, you see as you can rather than someone who you've lived like intimately with your entire life, just because you share genes with one and not with the other one. And so it's not really about how you're living, it's about just about uh, some code uh, that doesn't really exist in time, it's not part of the life process. Um, but also we use genetics to determine what's alive and what's not. So this, the official uh, biological definition of life that you learn in like a textbook says that living things have DNA and non-living things don't have DNA. Um, so this is why viruses aren't considered alive. Um, and so in this defi definition, there's no way to really consider the mineral part of soil as being alive, even though it participates in historical and, and life processes. Um, but then if you look at what's coming up from uh, learning about indigenous worldviews, uh, but not just from them, it's, it's also from these very new uh, post pasteurian cultures, and also from science, it's like a whole different way of looking at life uh, as, as this kind of dwelling together, and that together we're creating, uh, we're creating life, we're creating the world. And so this is why I, I really have like gotten a lot of uh, hope from doing this research, because it seems like things are, there's possibilities that things will get much better soon. Yeah, that's, uh, that's it. I'll sit down again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can discuss, sir. Uh...